My name is Marlene Zook. I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. And I'm interested in animal behavior and animal communication and animal mating, and I've been working on insects pretty much my whole career. I don't really consider myself an entomologist because I don't study insects qua insects. I'm not like interested in stuff about insects. I'm interested in sex and evolution and behavior and Insects are probably, you know, in my admittedly prejudiced opinion, the best way to study sex and evolution and behavior. It's not that I'll study anything about insects. So in that sense, I'm someone who's interested in sex, evolution, and behavior, not someone who's interested in only insects, but really it came to the same thing. <laughs> I had always worked on crickets and did research on them for my dissertation and have always been interested in how females find mates and what aspects of those mates are most attractive uh, because of being interested in the evolution of mating behavior and of communication signals. It's one of the great stories of evolution that islands like Hawaii, because of their enormous isolation, have led to tremendous diversification of all kinds of animals, um, birds and crickets and fruit flies and plants and all kinds of things. There was a conference in Hawaii, uh, an evolution conference, a long, quite a long time ago, well over 20 years ago, and I thought, well, it'd be fun, and I'd never gone to Hawaii. I was a fairly junior professor at the University of California Riverside at the time. And so I thought, oh, well, it'd be fun to go to this conference. But um, if I'm going to go to the conference uh, in Hawaii, I should try and do something else in addition to just going to the conference. And what would be a fun thing to do in Hawaii? And I, I now realize that this is not necessarily the, the most fun thing that a lot of people could think of. But for me, the fun thing was, could I think of a cricket that might be available for me to dissect and look at their parasites and look at their mating behavior. And, and I realize that for a lot of people, that's not the immediate thing that comes to mind when they want to go to Hawaii and extend their stay. But, you know, whatever. Um, it was what I decided to do. I consulted with a colleague who said, oh, there's loads of these introduced crickets, Teleogryllus oceanicus, on the grounds of the university where the conference was going to be held. And so you'd probably have an easy time, you know, messing around with them. And I thought, oh, sure, that seems perfect. They're an introduced cricket and they tend to go to disturbed habitats, places like lawns and fields and so forth, where they can just kind of burrow into the grass. They don't dig proper burrows, they're just out there in leaf litter or uh, just hidden from the view on the surface. So I was just messing around on the lawns and I started noticing that uh, I was seeing a few, well, quite a few crickets that were just walking around on the grass. And that's kind of unusual for crickets because usually it, it, it was at night and you know usually at night what crickets do, the males are um, you know, tucked away singing to attract females. And in what I always tell people is the only time that I've ever actually impressed my husband with my scientific acumen, I said, you know, the only other time I've ever heard of a lot of males walking around quietly is in this other system that's been studied in North America in which crickets are subject to this parasitic fly where the fly can hear the males calling and homes in on the males and deposits larvae and the larvae burrow in and eventually kill the cricket. And so from the cricket's perspective, calling less is um, advantageous, so they tend not to call as much. But I'd never heard of anything like that happening in Hawaii. And so, and then I thought, huh, this is weird. But I, I continued, I carried on collecting crickets and was dissecting them. I borrowed a microscope from someone in the entomology department at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And uh, lo and behold, like the next day, um, this gigantic fly larva comes out as I was dissecting, came out of the cricket. And I thought, wait a minute, this isn't really possible. But I reared some out and it turned out that I discovered that indeed there was one of these acoustically orienting parasitoid flies. I'll explain that sort of mouthful in a second. In this introduced field cricket in Hawaii and no one had ever found it before. And so the cricket is introduced, the fly is also introduced, the fly is native to North America as it turned out, and it's a really extraordinary life history where the fly has this amazing ability to hear cricket song. A female fly that's ready to reproduce will home in on the song of a male cricket 
she'll kind of dive bomb him. She's not laying eggs. She's actually dropping larvae on him, kind of like a fighter plane bombing. And so she's she's dropping these little tiny larvae. They burrow inside the male um, and live inside him while he's still alive for about a week or a little bit more than a week, eating what a former student of mine used to refer to as the gooey bits. Um, and so gradually consuming the tissue until eventually after that week or 10 days, the cricket is essentially kind of a husk of it, his former self. The fly larva emerges, pupates in the soil, and then becomes an adult, which completes the life cycle. And so I was really, I mean, it's not, it's obviously just gruesome and weird and really interesting, but I was really um, excited about studying it because it's a perfect illustration of how signals are always, you know, animal signals that are used in communication are always evolving in this trade-off where from a male's perspective, okay, calling is the way you get a female. So it's non-negotiable. You have to do this. But calling is also really costly because the more you call, the more likely you are to attract one of these deadly flies, which is obviously an incredible selective agent against calling. And so I'm really interested in what happens when you end up with conflicting selection pressures. And so this is a really, you know, where, you know, natural selection is pushing you one way, but also pushing you in the exact opposite direction. And so that's why the system was, has been so interesting to me over the years. So I worked on this system for, you know, quite a few years and discovered that um, the cricket and the fly occur together on three islands in Hawaii. Uh, so um, the big island of Hawaii, which is where I first found it, but also Kauai and also Oahu. And um, so they were present on all three islands. Um, the flies were there at different um, proportions so that on Kauai, the, almost a third of the males harbored these larvae. On Oahu, far fewer, and the big island was somewhere in the middle. And I did lots and lots of uh, cool experiments. I established um, lab populations of them when I was in California. And then um, through the 1990s, as I was working on them, I was noticing that the populations got smaller and smaller, and that was true everywhere, but particularly on Kauai, where they had had the highest proportion of, of the parasitic flies. And I had students out there working, and I was thinking, boy, you know, I, sooner or later, it's just going to go extinct. Because, you know, it is an, it's an unstable system because you've got a, two introduced species. Neither of them is, you know, the place where they originally evolved. Um, it's in a disturbed habitat. And so every single time I went, I would think, oh, this time they're going to be gone. In about 2000, I think it was 2001, we went and I managed to scrape up, you know, enough females to lay eggs for my lab colony. And I think I maybe heard one calling male. Um, and I thought, okay, this is probably the beginning of the end. I didn't go at all in 2002 to Kauai because I thought, oh, well, never mind. We're just not going to find anything. And then uh, in 2003, it was kind of the tail end of a trip to do something, to do some other cricket work. And I thought, okay, we'll just whiz by for a few days and, and just see if there, there's anything there. And if not, then I'll just, you know, put a line under it and we're done. And um, so, uh, you know, we went to the place where um, we usually hear the crickets. I didn't hear anything, but you know, you may as well get out of the car. And so I, uh, you know, got out of the car and put on my headlamp, obviously it's, uh, at night, started walking down to the place where we usually collected them. And all of a sudden in the grass, um, I started seeing a ton of crickets. And um, I did, still didn't hear anything, but I was seeing lots of crickets climbing around um, on the, you know, grass in the, um, and the low shrubs. And so, so I always tell people, like, if you're not a cricket person, you will not understand, like, what a moment of cognitive dissonance this is. But if you are a cricket person, you know, then you do because, so the deal is that if you are out at night and there's crickets, then you should hear crickets calling because that's what crickets do. It's kind of their race on etre, right? It's, it's their whole thing, is that's what a cricket is all about. And if you're out at night and you don't hear crickets, then there aren't any crickets. But, you know, there I was and there were all these crickets but there weren't any cricket song. And so it was like one of those weird little loops, you know, where, well, there can't be any crickets because I don't hear any crickets, but there are crickets because I'm seeing crickets, but I'm not hearing any crickets. So how can there possibly be any crickets out there? Um, and I always tell people it took me, you know, like a long time, like to come to grips with myself uh, dur during all of this. Um, I'm sure longer than it probably should have. And eventually um, what we figured out, and this was uh, work done um, with a former student of mine, uh, Robin Tingatella, who's now at the University of Denver, as well as my 
husband, John Rotenberry, who's been helping me with the project forever, that we eventually figured out that what had happened on Kauai and what we've now established on the other islands as well is the very rapid spread of a mutation that renders the male silent. So what it does is affect the wings of the male crickets. So crickets call by rubbing their wings together. I always tell people it makes a sound like if you uh, ran your fingernail across a comb, so sort of a brr, brr noise um, as uh, your fingernail goes over each of the teeth of the comb. And they've got a file and a scraper, and they've also got these modified wing veins that are um, called the harp and the mirror um, that serve as resonating structures to help amplify the sound. And so cricket wings on a normal male cricket are quite complicated. But these males that had what we later came to find was um, a mutation, were not just behaviorally refraining from calling, they just couldn't call because they lacked all of those structures that allow a cricket to produce his sound. Um, and we call them flat wings um, because the wings are flat rather than being modified with all of those specialized structures. They look somewhat like female wings because female wings never call, females never call and so the females don't have uh, modified wings. But in every other way, they're totally normal males and they can reproduce and they you know produce sperm and all the rest of it but they very rapidly in the population the the populations now have a high proportion of these males with this mutation we've also demonstrated that it's due to a single sex linked gene and so that was astonishing from a whole bunch of perspectives. The first one of which was how quickly it spread. So even assuming I missed the start of it in the early or in the late 90s, which you know is possible. I don't think it was any earlier than that because I was I've been collecting pretty regularly. Um, so let's say I missed it in the late 90s. There's three to four generations a year. By 2003, it was well established. So you have to figure five years, maybe at the most, 20 generations or less, you know, less than that. That, which is astonishing to see an instance of not only rapid evolution, but the loss of a sexual signal. A mutation means a change in a gene, right? And so you can have mutations in lots of genes, you can have mutations in just one. As it turns out, this was a change in just one gene, which seems a little odd at first, but then when you think about it, it's not really that strange because of course, a wing develops along a pathway that requires the input of a lot of genes, but if you break something in that pathway early enough in the process, then the whole rest of it can't happen. So, you know, it would be like, like imagine an embryo, crickets have somewhat different development, obviously, than people do, but imagine like a, a human embryo where something in the development of a leg went awry very early on. You could imagine even just a single gene. Well, if you don't get the bone developing, then you don't get, you know, the muscles developing, then you don't get the nerves connecting the muscles, you know, together, then you don't get the bones that, you know, are held together with the, you know, so, so you get this cascade of effects. So a single gene really can have a big effect. You know, on the one hand, I, you know, it was obviously, you know, total luck. On the other hand, you know, it does help to have known that this kind of stuff happens before. And I, I think it really is fun that, you know, if you start paying attention to insects, that you can discover these extraordinary things that are happening without anybody knowing them. You know, so I always tell people, if all the peacocks in the world suddenly got up one morning and their tails had fallen off, people would know. But this, which is exactly analogous, nobody knew. So first of all, I should say that everybody always thinks, oh, Hawaii, this all sounds so glamorous and it must be really fun doing this. So, so two things, one of them is that the crickets are on lawns and like outside of disturbed like buildings and they're, and of course they're active at night. And so really you're spending most of your time in the field looking for them on your hands and knees in the dark on a lawn, so, so that's one thing, is that the, the field work is not all that glamorous. And then, of course, the other part of it is that 90% of what we do is in the lab. That's another reason insects are so cool, is that they'll behave for you under lab conditions, and you can get a really good idea about a lot of different things that, that they do. Um, so, for instance, um, 
We'll look at what kind of things about cricket calls females prefer by setting up um, these, you know, super low tech arenas that are basically cardboard boxes cut up and, you know, taped back together so that you can put a speaker playing sound at one end and the female at the other. And then you give her a variety of options to choose from. And she, we look at how fast she responds to different ones, or we'll put a male and female together and look at different behaviors that they do. Or, you know, it is really pretty low tech. I mean, having said that, I have colleagues with whom I'm collaborating where we're looking at gene expression and lots of complicated Uh, lots of complicated aspects of their reproductive biology, like whether there's anything in the sperm of the males that influences uh, the outcome of reproductive success and so on and so forth. But a lot of it at heart is kind of low tech and just trying to figure out what animals do. Polynesian field crickets, Kauai, Hawaii, Telegrillus oceanicus. Gone now the sound of Hawaiian crickets. Ocracia flies located them by their song, peppered them with maggots, like little burning kisses, hot needles that probed and stung and burrowed in, that possessed their hosts like edible moving rooms, ate their living tissues, and shut them down one organ at a time. Only the quietest males survived to pass on flat and feminine wings. The species lost both harp and file, but gained in strength, flying at night to find a mate, pheromones in the dark between a sweet and subtle beckoning, tugging at the many threads of air, strange synchronies and shivers, which continue under the radar of all surveillance, beyond all parasitic listening, that faint click on the tapped line, a fly homing in, When the season swelters now, the male cricket may twitch his wings as if, deep in its cells, the species half remembers song. The way, long after the cellist lays his instrument down, the music still goes on, his muscles twitch in time, the melody sadder, keener for being remembered. And though it's a simple chemical invitation the female cricket sends, its tenor is clear and ravishing and mine, this body's own dumb longing, its irrepressible chemical call, I want you, I want you, I want you. Translation. One of the great things for me about studying insects is I find it kind of humbling, if that doesn't sound a little bit self-serving, because everybody always expects animals to be like little people, you know, and they interpret them as though they're like little people, and they have emotions like little people, and they, um, you know, have motivations like little people. And one of the great things about studying insects is that they shake you out of that complacency because they are not like little people. They are really different from little people. And so you can kid yourself and say, oh, yes, you know, the cricket wants to do this because it's jealous of the other. But, you know, come on, you're talking about an animal that has a brain, if you can even call it that, that's like the size of a sesame seed. So really, you think that they're just like little people? Well, then in that case, what's our whole big thing up here for? And if you don't think they're like little people, then what are they like? And I think they're not like little people, and so I want to find out what they're like. 